Okay, so it's uh, three o'clock local time. Let's get started. The second speaker of the session is Kevin Costello from the Perimeter Institute to tell us about 3D n equals two chiral algebras and dualities. Kevin, please. Okay, th thank you very much. So I'm I'm going to talk about um, some work I've been doing the past couple of years. With I suppose it started with work uh, paper we wrote with Mina and Jake McNamara and Cameron, and uh, more recently we have a recent paper with. Uh, Tudor and Davide, and I have some other er, earlier work, work with Davide and Thomas Kreuzig. Um, and it's about chiral algebras related to 3D n equals 2 theories, and also a little bit about 3D n equals 4 theories as well. Um, so, we've seen a few talks about 3D n equals 2 and n equals 4 theories uh, in, this, in this conference, and so we know that they play a very important role in both math and physics. So, one one, one way they do so is you take a 3D n equals 2 theory and you put it on a circle. Of course, you get the two dimensional 2 commit 2 model. So you would expect that, that the 3D n equals 2 theory knows about quantum k theory. So if I have a gauge group G and matter V, I should, I should uh, 3D n equals 2 theory should know about quantum k theory of the quotient stack. This was studied by, amongst others, uh, Dockers and Meyer. Um, there's, there are many rich dualities with 3D n equals 2 theories. Well, if, you, if I take an n equals 4 theory and view it as n equals 2, um, the 3D mirror symmetry of 3D n equals 4 theories, but when, I, when I view it as uh, just with the n equals 2 supersymmetry algebra, um, this is related to how Kunkov is studying 3D mirror symmetry, Kunkov and his collaborators. Because in, in a Kunkov's approach, 3D mirror symmetry is a duality which interchanges quantum K theory on both sides. Um, and of course, we've seen that 3D n equals 2 theories have a, can be engineered from M5 brains, so there's a very rich, complicated, and beautiful story, which I don't know very well, and I won't say anything about. So what I find like, slightly unsatisfying about the literature on 3D equals 2 theories is that most computations, or most dualities people study, they, they check them by looking at the index, which is the character of the space of supersymmetric local local. So there's, you know, of course, there's been lots of beautiful and difficult work studying the index, um, which I obviously can't summarize here. Um, but what I would like to be able to do is to, to lift this to something a little more like homological mirror symmetry, where instead of studying the index, we're going to study the underlying algebraic structure. So this will be the bulk operators, which are supersymmetric. This will be some algebra whose character will, will give you the index, and similarly a boundary algebra. And I'd like to be able to define and compute these algebras and verify that the dualities you're interested in hold at the level of these algorithms. So this was studied in our recent paper with Tudor and Davide. And we made some progress, but I think there's a lot of you know, like interesting open problems in, in, in this vein because, well, as you'll see, we were not actually able to prove that many dualities. We ran into very difficult problems of computing cohomology groups uh, when we tried to prove the more interesting dualities. So what, what I like to describe is the, the algebras, as I said, of supersymmetric local operators, mostly in the boundary, but with some information about the bulk. And then to formulate in this language some 3D n equals 2 dualities and to explain some simple cases how we can actually prove them at the level of the algebra. So the starting point is, of course, we're going to be studying the, the supersymmetric localization. So what I mean by this is we take the physical theory and we add to the BRST operator a nilpotent and supercharge Q. Um, once we do this, this procedure will give us what I will call, for the purposes of this talk, the twisted theory. So I'm, I'm emphasizing 
adding this global and supercharge rather than changing the spins of the fields. And this twisted theory was, was studied by, uh, I think it's So we study this. Back, sorry about that. So we studied this in this paper with with Mina, Jake McNamara, and, and Cameron Vaffa. We wrote down a little grange in describing the twisted theory. So one important point is that there is not a topological twist. In the twisted theory, um, the stress energy tensor is not zero. It has a Z component, it has a single component. So another way to say that is if I take an operator in the twisted theory, um, it will be independent of time and be holomorphic in space, but it will not be killed by d by dz. Similarly, if we're going to study the boundary, the operators will be holomorphic functions. Z bar. So on the boundary, it looks a little bit like a carrot already. Okay, so we can ask what? So we have this collection of operators, which are if they're independent of time and are homomorphic functions of Z, what algebraic structure will they have? So if I was thinking about describing this in the physical language, a more, you know, more physical point of view. So on the bulk, I would say it's a Poisson vertex algebra, where the Poisson bracket is of degree minus one. This was studied in a recent paper of Owen Yagi. So let me this other thing up here, which is supposed to explain this. So, so the way this arises is by descent. If I have two operators, O and O prime, I take the descendant of O prime is here. The, the descendant of O prime. It's a one form with dz bar and dt components. And well, if you're familiar with descent, you know that q of oz bar is the z bar derivative of o. So this is the kind of this off shell. Um, and the shifted Poisson bracket is, is defined by this formula. I integrate an operator at zero against this descendant on the, along the t-sphere. Because I'm descending, that's why I get this shift by one. If I was thinking of this in more mathematical terms, I would say it's an E1 chiral algebra, it's like a vertex algebra with a compatible associative bracket, associative product, in which case the Poisson vertex algebra would arise by, by thinking about an Ekman Hilton operator, the compatibility. Now, on the boundary, well, we, we simply have a vertex algebra. But it's very important that this vertex algebra does not have a stress tensor. The reason is this, there's a stress tensor in the bulk, but if I differentiate an operator in the boundary, that's not realized by a contour integral around that, around that operator. It's realized by an integral around a hemisphere of the bulk stress tensor, or rather the descendant of the bulk stress tensor. So these vertex algebras are not they're very, very, very different from the, the ones we're most familiar with, like from rational conformal field theory. Okay, so it's kind of clear what the algebraic structure will be. So let's see what the main difficulty is. So the main problem is three-dimensional theories have monopole operators. So this is a local operator which sources a gauge field which has some um, charge on the two sphere surrounding that that point. So it's, it's going to be very difficult to figure out how to de define the algebra of monopole operators. For n equals four theories, when I when we introduce the, the topological twist, this problem was solved in this this great work of uh, Braverman, and Finkelberg and Nakajima. Um, so what they did was they introduced an infinite dimensional algebraic variety, and they they said that the space of the algebra of monopole operators is the homology of the space. 
they call it the space of triples. And that the product on the algebra of monopoles, the, not the, just the algebra of operators in the twisted 3D n equals 4 theory, the product is just given by some, some convolution of this infinite dimensional algebraic row. And let me bring up an line again. So there's, you know, there, they didn't write it in this way, but their construction is a very physical interpretation. So if I study the space of solutions to the equations in motion on a cylinder like this with a point removed, it looks like their space of triplets. Modulo the group, the group of automorph the group of gate transformations on one of the disks. Um what's the point on what you know? The space of triples is like it's a G bundle with a section here, a G bundle with a section there, and as I move along, I get an isomorphism which has a pole at the origin. So just by studying geometric quantization around a sphere surrounding my place I want to put the operator, you're you're led immediately to their construction. So we can try to do the same thing for n equals two. But well. The reason we found homology in their construction is when, when I reduce along that sphere, I found some, some quantum mechanical system with an infinite dimensional space of fields. And there was enough supersymmetry so that the twist gave me homology, as is familiar from you know, twisted quantum mechanics. But for n equals two, that is not what we find. We find just the double homology, the coherent homology not the Durand So this is much more complicated. It's a much more interdimensional space. So I don't want to you shouldn't be confused by the word coherent homology. It's just the linear dual of coherent of you know, homology. And we should think about think about this space as some some space of distributions on an interdimensional variety. So this is in contrast to the work of Bravman, Finkelberg, and Nakajima. Where the space was some space of cycles on an infinite dimensional variety. So the difficulty is, well, maybe we can define the space of distributions, but I find it extremely dif difficult to figure out how to define the product. Um, this could just be a personal failing. There is a school of people, for instance, Gates Gurie and Sam Raskin, who are with great expertise in the dimensional algebraic geometry and maybe maybe they have the techniques to do it but it seems very difficult to me but if we could do this the answer all we would find would be very interesting so they take an n equals four theory and i view it as n equals two how did they take this n equals two twist and i take I suppose i was able to define the bulk operators and i take a spectrum the kind of thing you might find is one part of it should look like the infinite jets on the shifted tangent bundle of the Higgs branch, and another part of it should look like the infinite jets on the shifted tangent bundle of the Coulomb branch. So it's something that you should know that should know about the Higgs and Coulomb branches of the angles. But there might also be mixed branches. So as we go on, I'm going to see another way to approach defining this algebra, which works sometimes. Now, in the n equals four case, you know, once I pass to the n equals two twist, I have two more supersymmetries which will localize me to either the Higgs or Coulomb branch. So, in the n equals four case, well, this whatever we should find here is some very rich algebra which knows about. Barbara and Finkelberg Nakajima construction. Okay, so, so far I've been kind of explaining things I don't really know how to do. But it turns out if we study the algebra of operators in the boundary, we can do a lot better. And in some cases, understanding the boundary algebra is enough to reconstruct the bulk algebra. Let me say what, what the data of the n equals two theory is. 
We have a group, a representation of the group, and a key invariant superpotential, and it turns out as well. Uh, there might be more complicated things. For instance, in some situations, the superpotential will depend on monopole operators. Well, let's not include those for now. So to this data and a choice of boundary condition, we're going to produce a vertex algebra. So let's start by assuming we just have matter, that we just have the simplest thing is one free chiral. So then there's two, there's two choices of boundary condition with Neumann boundary condition. I have a, a, a bosonic field on the boundary, but it has trivial OB with itself. The reason is this bosonic this bosonic operator can be extended into the bulk, which which prevents the possibility of finding any singularities in the OP. And similarly, with Dirichlet boundary conditions, I have a single fermionic field, but again, trivial OP. And it's important to note that with the natural spin, this fermionic field here is spin one. So that more generally, suppose I have some number k of chiral fields with some super potential. And I give some of them Neumann and some of them Dirichlet. And let us assume that the super potential vanishes on the boundary. That is, if I set to zero those fields which have Dirichlet boundary condition, their super potential becomes zero. So then I have some on the boundary, I have some bosonic fields coming from those, those fields which have Neumann, and some fermionic field coming from those fields which have Dirichlet. And we have the following formula for the boundary BRFT operator and for the boundary OBEs. U of psi is the derivative of the superpotential, and the OBE of two psi's is the second derivative of the superpotential. Now, in principle, if somebody could pin down what an A-infinity vertex algebra was, you could imagine this pattern continuing and giving you the higher products in terms of the higher derivatives. I, I don't really have a good understanding of that, though. Another case you might consider is if all of your boundary conditions are Neumann, well, then the super, super potential will not vanish on the boundary, that's the zero. And we have an anomaly. So to cancel this anomaly, just like in the 2D D model with this potential, we need to choose a matrix factorization. But here it's a chiral matrix factorization. So in the literature with 3D and equals 2 theories, normally people describe this in terms of coupling, you know, E and J terms coupling to boundary, boundary from Fermi multiply. But in this context, it's really quite general. I can take any chiral algebra and any fermionic element of my chiral algebra to join these commuting bosonic fields. And I want uh, <clears throat> the singular term of the OP of this fermionic element with itself to be the superpotential. Then I can add, I can add, um, I can add this, the, the integral theta to q, and then that will cancel, you know. Let's look at a simple example. Suppose I take a single chiral with super potential w equals x squared. Then if I take Dirichlet boundary conditions, the boundary algebra is simply one pre fermion. Because if I look back a little bit, the OPE was psi times psi is the second derivative. And the second derivative of, of, of this guy will, will give you the usual <clears throat> uh, OPE of one free fermion. And in this case, um, because of the presence of the super potential, it's natural to change the spin of the bulk field so that this fermion ends up having spin a half. <clears throat> Here's another example which will be important for us. We take the XYZ model. So I have three chirals, the superpotential is x, y, z. 
and I want to give them Neumann Dirichlet Dirichlet boundary conditions. Now there were two uh, the superposition contributed to the BRST operator and also the LB. Well, the first derivative of the superpotential vanishes in the boundary, so that doesn't contribute to the, so we get no, no change in the BRST operator. We do get this kind of funny OBE, where my two fermionic operator, which come from the Dirichlet boundary condition, the OBE is my bosonic operator. So this will be important later, because I want to, um, to check in a little bit the dual, the dual of this boundary condition gives you the same chiral algebra. So the dual of the XYZ model is FQED. That is, uh, it's a U1 gauge theory with no, no transpimance level and a single chiral. So it's a single chiral for both of them. Sorry, two chirals. So to do that, we need to understand something about gauge theories. Now, for gauge theory, if I was to choose to reach the boundary conditions, the problem we ran into earlier arises that there are boundary monopoles. It turns out that for technical reasons, I can, we kind of understand boundary monopoles a little bit better than both monopoles. But in any case, let's, let's, assume, let's work in a setting where there are no boundary monopoles by assuming we have Neumann boundary conditions for the gauge. And then we'll choose boundary conditions for the matter so that there's no anomaly. We might be forced to add on some boundary fermions or something like that, depending on the churn Simons level. Then whatever we get for the matter, I'm going to call it. So this includes contribution of the bulk matter together with any boundary fields we need to add on, either to, for a matrix factorization or to cancel a churn Simons anomaly. So for the full system, for, for the gauge theory with matter, the answer is very simple. All we do is we take C and we adjoin the C ghost. So I'll clarify this a little more carefully for this in a second. But it is very important that this is not BRST reduction, so that we do not have a B ghost. There is also no current. There's no particular reason the action of the gauge group on C arises from a current, from a boundary current, it arises from a bulk current. In any case, it doesn't make sense to join the C ghost and write down the familiar formula for the BRST operator. Normally we would write Q of an operator in terms of the integral of current. So here, I don't wanna do that. I just, I'm just here writing Q of the operator is given by how it transforms under the action of this Lie algebra of arcs in G, which is the boundary gauge symmetry on a small disk. Now, from a math point of view, this construction is extremely simple. All we're doing is we're taking whatever boundary algebra I had and taking the derived invariant with respect to what's called G of O, which is another name for ones. Another name for G of Z. So let's see how this works for SQED. Oh, actually, one more point. So in, in what follows, it's extremely important that, well, I was being slightly misleading when we say join the C ghost. So what we have to do is something. I think it's well known in some circles. Uh, we have to, so the purpose of adjoining ghosts is to impose gauge invariance cohomologically. So the, for the constant gauge transformations, because that's a reductive group, we should just impose gauge invariance directly for those guys. So that means we shouldn't include the C ghost itself, only its derivatives. That is, we, we take the algebra containing my, my C, my whatever I get from the matter, I join the derivatives of the C ghost with this BRST operator, and then I take the invariant subalgebra 
with respect to the global peace and freedom. So that's all that is encoded in the broad invariance of the G of O because G of O is a pronoun but an extension of a reductive group. So that's the right thing to do in that context. Let's do an example. Let's do SQED. We take two chirals and you engage theory with two chirals of charges plus or minus one. And we're going to study the boundary conditions, which are Neumann, Neumann, Neumann. So what does that mean? Well, we already saw for the gauge fields, the Neumann boundary condition we should uh, introduce the ghost. And for the two chirals, we'll get boundary, boundary bosonic fields with trivial B. But to cancel, uh, cancel the anomaly, we'll also like to join a complex fermion. So the plus or minus indicates the charges of this fermion under the U1 gauge symmetry. Charge one minus one, and they have the standard OB. So what's the boundary algebra? As we said, we take the matter part, this guy, generated by gamma plus or minus and phi plus or minus. And then I join the derivative of the ghost, and then I take the U1 invariant. Now, one of the basic dualities in three-dimensional n equals two theories is between the XYZ model and the SQED model. Now, the boundary version of this was studied in this paper, which I should say was kind of inspires, you know, a lot of what we're trying to do here is to kind of categorify what's in that paper. Um, so they, they argued that, and they checked at the, at the level of the index, that the XYZ model with the Neumann to reach day to reach day should be dual to SQED with Neumann, Neumann, Neumann plus these fermions in the band. Okay, so as a first check, um, so the whole you know, program would be to see if we can find isomorphisms between bulk and boundary algebras under these dualities. So let's check this one. Uh, we would expect an isomorphism between the boundary algebra here and the boundary algebra here, and we prescribe them both. So the theorem is the boundary vertex algebra with respect by Z and SQED are isomorphic. So let's see how this works. So if you remember, for the XYZ model, because it was a Neumann to reach day to reach day, the Neumann guy, if we had this boundary scalar field, and the two Dirichet ones give these boundary fermionic fields. And the superpotential gives rise to this OPE, where the two fermionic fields combine to give the bosonic field pi. So as a first check, we'd like to find some operators in the boundary of SQED, which satisfy this OPE. Now the operators have to be U1 invariant, and if you think about how spins things have and how they so on other symmetries. Well, the only reasonable possibility is, is psi y and psi z must be sent to these combinations of the boundary fermions. Because on the member on SQED, on the boundary I have complex fermion, so fermionic fields of charges one minus one, and I also have these scalar fields, these bosonic fields of charges one minus one, and I combine them to get fields of charge zero. And the only other field of charge zero is this one, phi plus phi minus. So in this way, we get a homomorphism. And it is a homomorphism because if I take the OPE between these operators here, the gamma plus and gamma minus will give, will, will annihilate, give me one over z, and that uh, times this operator. So this is indeed a homomorphism. It's very easy to check. We would really like an isomorphism, but that's really not obvious at all because on the SQED side, we presented the algebra um, in this theorist T way, and there could be all kinds of higher cohomology. In particular, what we, we don't see where the derivative of the ghost is. 
So it could be that on the on the SQBD side, we have an operator del C, which does not appear in the image of the homomorphism for the XYZ algebra. But fortunately, if you carefully calculate the BRST operator, you find Q of the normal, normally ordered product of gamma plus gamma minus is the derivative of the ghost. So we, it requires some work, but you can convince yourself that all the other cohomology groups vanish and that this map is in fact less complex. So it, it's at this point where things become difficult in more general cases. Because you would like to be able to prove the same kind of thing for other dualities, like Aroni duality, which is which this is a special case. And so one example would be I take SQCD with the NC equals NF. On the other side, the duality, I find a, a theory without gauge symmetry. So I have an N squared matrix of chirals and two other chirals, and then this super potential. And then Dimofte, Gaiodo, and Piquet argued that there was an equivalence of boundary conditions like this. So what we can show is that there's a homomorphism. We, I, unfortunately, it seems really, really hard to check that it's an isomorphism because computing the cohomology groups on this side, on the SQCD side, the cohomology seems to be really hard to compute. With one exception, when n is one, which is the case we already did, or else when n is very, very large. When n is very, very large, it kind of gets boring. But I, I, I did do, I, I was able to compute the cohomology when it, you know, when I take boundary operators, which are written as words, which are small compared to N, in which case it works. Okay, so this is Norman for gauge fields. So to really, to get further, we, we'd also want to describe all kinds of other boundary conditions. Well, in principle, any other boundary condition should be obtained by coupling appropriate matter to the Neumann boundary condition for gauge fields. We do have a direct description of Dirichlet. So Dirichlet, there's, um, there are of course boundary monopoles. So what we were able to do is describe the vacuum module on the boundary in terms of the affine graph matter. So what we found is the boundary vacuum module is the homology, the Affengrassmannian, with coefficients in a, a very big vector bundle, algebraic vector bundle, built from the matter fields and the tautological line model on the Affengrassmannian, sorry, the determinant line model on the Affengrassmannian, tensor to the trin Simons. Now, for instance, in the case there is no matter, this is a description of the vacuum module for the WCW model, which I think was proved by Sherwin Kumar in the 80s. Um, but in the case there is matter, you know, it's, some, it's something more general. It seems hard to, to understand or to compute, but we were able to prove it has the correct index by using localization on the FOS. Um, another difficulty we had, we, we found it a bit hard to show that this vacuum model, to construct the OBE in this vacuum model. Um, so Sam Raskin told us he had some techniques using the, the Bales and Rinfeld approach to vertex algebras, which would allow us allow him to do that. So I think that can be done. Okay, so I found this up. So let me move on a little bit to discussing how one might understand them both, because everything I've said so far was about the boundary vertex algebra. So, in a TDTFT, people might be familiar with the fact that if you know everything about the boundary, for a nice enough boundary condition, you can recover the bulk algebra as a Hochschild cohomology of the boundary algebra. Um, so this is expected to hold when you, when say the boundary condition you choose is a generator of the category of boundary, of boundary conditions. So somehow when the boundary condition is big enough. 
Um, an example, if I took a sigma model, the beat with the sigma model would target some, some clavier. My boundary condition was was to reach at some point. You know that the skyscraper sheet for that point doesn't doesn't know about the whole clavier, so then it wouldn't work. On the other hand, if it was Neumann with coefficients and some 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 vector bundle, then you know if the vector bundle was sufficiently ample, it would work. So with Davide and Thomas Kreutzig, we were studying whether something similar will hold in this 3D case. So the conjecture, which as I just pointed out, can't really, can't really hold for every boundary condition that's taken, huh? is that if I take the boundary vertex algebra, then the bulk algebra is the self X in the category of C modules of the vacuum. If you think about it a little bit, this is the analog of Hochul cohomology in the Roman vertex algebra. So we, we propose this for any case four C V. I should point out it's very it's very closely related to something in Shooter's talk because uh, this category is very closely related to what you, the D modules on the loop loop group on the loop space that appeared in Tudor's talk. Um, so one, one aspect of this I find kind of fascinating is that, well, we did check this in some cases and we, have, we do have a kind of, we do have a general form, formal argument for why this could be true, although we don't have a proof in that many cases. But if, we, if this is really true, then um, the vertex algebra knows both Higgs and Coulomb branch of the Higgs four theory because we saw Tom Beatty's talk, the Higgs branch is the associated variety and the Coulomb branch is the derived center. Okay, so we would like to extend this to um, equals two from n equals four. So purely formal reasoning tells us that there must be a homomorphism from the bulk, whatever the bulk algebra is, this self x. Because if I take a bulk operator and I bring it to the boundary like there, that commutes with the OBE of any boundary operator. But it commutes up to coherent homotopy. So that means it's an endomorphism of the vacuum module in the category of C modules up to homotopy. And that's what this, this space is, is the derived endomorphisms. So my student, Kei Zeng, checked that this really holds for n equals two theories, which are pure matter. So the point is, in the case of pure matter, there's no bulk monopoles, so you, we don't run into this issue. And you can just, we know what the bulk algebra is just directly, you know what the boundary algebra is, and we can just compute both sides and we check the the RG that's morphic. So we'd like to suggest that this is a reasonable definition for gauge theories, where I take Neumann boundary conditions for the gauge field, and then assign the boundary algebra as, as we did above, and then compute the self x of the vacuum module, which, and, we're, and this will give us a candidate for the bulk algebra. Well, why is this reasonable? I mean, if we take any gauge theory where the boundary Right. Take any gauge theory which is dual to a theory of some chirals with some superpotential, it has to be true. By this, by this argument of Kiyu Zeng, because as it's true for, for any theory of chirals with any superpotential. So let's look at the XYZ model again. And we'll check, does this really work? There are XYZ and the SQED model. Um, so, can you prove that the self X in the XYZ case is indeed the correct bulk operators? You know, there's, there's three, three bosonic operators, three fermionic operators, which, and some, some VRC operator and, some, and so on. 
But now we know that the, on the boundary, the x, y, z boundary, boundary algebra is isomorphic to the SQD boundary algebra. So therefore, these things are just the same. If I take the self x of the SQED and the self x of the x, y, z, we get the same thing. So that tells us that the self x of the SQED vacuum module is the correct bulk algebra. Now we see something kind of remarkable. Even though on the boundary of the SQED model, it was really perturbative. We didn't in insert any non-perturbative operators at all. We found the correct bulk algebra, including the monopole operator. The point is that the monopole operator is one of the three fields X, Y, and Z. I mean, our conventions in X. And if you track through where it comes from, it comes from X1. So one minute, please. Okay. So here suggests a general strategy that we can use Neumann boundary conditions to compute the boundary algebra. It's purely perturbative, and then attempt to compute the bulk algebra by using the self axis of the vacuum. Uh, So some of these computations get pretty hard, but I think this is, this is a, a doable thing for a billion gauge theories, and I, I really want to see how far we can push this. Let's see, do see anything else? Uh, uh. Yeah, there's... So one, one fun generalization is, can you do this in five dimensions too, for 5dn equals one? Well, I did a little computation for 5dn equals one, or on the boundary, the boundary algebra with Neumann boundary conditions for the gauge field is a very similar description. And if you compute the self x in a similar way, of course, it's not a vertex algebra anymore because I have two monomorphic directions. You do, you do see something which recovers the, the, um, the known index, including incident operators, but only for operators of positive incident algebras. Okay, so let me. Stop there, and I will stop showing. So, second speaker. So, Sergey Guhov. Please. On. Hi, Kevin. Uh, thank you for a wonderful talk. This was very nice. Um, I have a very low brow question. In two dimensional theories with zero two supersymmetry, we know that um, non perturbative effects can sometimes change perturbative chiral rings, like Pico homology. And um, this 2D, 3D couple system is very similar in many ways. So, obvious question is um, what do we know about non perturbative effects? And more importantly, um, under what conditions can we trust uh, the perturbative chiral ring, perturbative boundary? Ah, I find that the, the only non effect I could think of would be um, with the monopole, like the boundary monopole operators, which I, I can assume aren't there if I use Norman boundary conditions. Was there an, another concern you have? Um, I suppose you could have boundary vortex operators if your chirals were periodic. Is that the kind of thing you're thinking about? Well, in two dimensions with zero two supersymmetry, not all of them are well understood, but even in sigma models, there could be such effects. Uh, so, question is very general, low bro. Yeah. Okay. I mean, hmm. I think I feel fairly confident as long as we just have chirals on flat space with a super potential, maybe with some homogeneity. I, th I think as long as your, your chirals are doing something curved, I, it could get much more complicated. I agree. Cyber. Yeah, so first of all, the comment. So before that, wonderful talk. Thank you. A comment to Sergey. There are many examples of 3D n equals 2 theories where the chiral ring is modified from the classical answer. But this is, this is a rather common thing, just as it's common in four dimensions and in two dimensions. 
but I also have a question for Kevin. Uh, there is some insight into these dualities in 3D N equals two is arising from compactification of N equals one in D equals four, which is not unlike compactification of two zero theory, giving us insight about what happens in lower dimensions after compactification. So my question is, can you get anything by compactifying a four dimensional theory on a circle or maybe more sophisticated compactification to learn about these three dimensional theories? I find myself really confused by this. And so I kind of, I did try to think about it, but I got kind of stuck because if we, you know, if we, if we were to apply supersymmetric localization in four dimensions with n equals one supersymmetry, there is only enough supersymmetry to make it holomorphic. But then I have no, and then if you reduce in a circle, I just have no idea where the monopole operators could come from. Because you can't, because you can't really things wrapping that circle so easily in a holomorphic theory. So I, yeah. The general rule is that when you reduce the theory from four dimensions to three dimensions, you need to add the monopole operator by hand to the three-dimensional theory in order to get a good duality. Uh, so, okay. well, the comment you just made really hits hits the nail on the head because, uh, yeah, for precisely this reason. So the nice dualities in three dimensions arise by adding this monopole operator to, by hand. And in fact, you alluded to that in your talk when you mentioned Aharoni's dualities because they also have the monopole operator in the Lagrangian. Mm -hmm. I feel like I would really like to understand Aroni's argument better, which I don't know where those came from, but I think until I do that, I don't think I can really say anything to your question. Thank you. Whitmore? Yeah, when when you when you derive when you derive the bulk algebra as a derived center of a vertex operator algebra on the boundary, mm -hmm. you're using a some cat. So first of all, it's the vertex operator algebra does or does not have a stress energy tensor. Does not. Ah, so I'm not quite sure what category of modules you're using. Okay, so what, what you do is you take the mode algebra of your vertex algebra, and that's some giant topological associate of algebra, and you just look at modules for that. But probably you want to bound below the, the, the debate. Well, yeah, I was wondering if they were bounded below. And well, I, since there's not a since there's not a stress energy tensor, I'm not even sure what that means. But well, it has it has a it has an action of of the conformal symmetry group, it's just not an interaction. Ah, okay. So, is there an L naught? Uh, everything is charged under L naught, but there's no current giving you that charge on the boundary. Are so your modules bounded below by L naught? Yes. Ah. Yeah, I think. The paper with Thomas and Davide, I think we had some, some discussion about this because there was a disagreement between me and Thomas about the best way to treat this point, which led to different answers in the computations. Like he, he wanted, I mean, his initial approach was a kind of traditional thing you might do for or CFTs, and then you find very, you, don't get, you don't get the same answer. You don't get the right bulk answer, I think. I mean, traditionally, you might look at uh, it's like semi simple modules, and then you, you don't. And that there's, there's no interesting extensions. This category is a semi-simple category or not? Absolutely not, no. Not? No, absolutely The simplest example is just take one, one free chiral with, uh, with normal boundary conditions. And then the category is just, I take the loop space of C. And it's some kind of category of coherent sheaves on that. 
And that clearly is not something simple because even sheaves on C has X1. So. I see, thanks. Okay, in three dimensional super transparent case, I mean, three dimensional equal to super symmetric transparent symmetric series, there are many non local operators like Basonic BPS world loops constructed by Gato and E and also for many were constructed by Ouyang, Zhang, and myself. So where is this BPS world loops play some role in your discussion here? Thanks. Uh, the audio wasn't great there, but I think the, uh, the non-local operators you see would be, well, there's, uh, um, the initial ones you might study would, would be line defects, which could be vortex lines, Wilson lines. Yeah. Um, so one thing I kind of skipped over, I was running out of time, is that if you have a nice boundary condition, you might expect, kind of similarly to the tutor's talk, that the category of line defects is the category of modules of the vertex. Okay, thanks. I don't see any more questions, so uh, let's thank the speaker again, and we'll pick up at uh, 1600 local time, so in nine minutes. I team up.